So yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Chen Tao. Wow, so many people. That's uh, pretty surprising. So yeah, anyways, because uh, I joined uh, the, I attended the meetup like a couple times like a few years back, but uh, never so many people. Anyways, so yeah, uh, today I want to talk about, uh, this is like, from one of my blog posts, uh, machine learning down run. I wanted to share some of my experience uh, working in different companies. I've seen a lot of the common mistakes made by many other uh, practitioners. And I also want to share some of the suggestion uh, to kind of prevent those uh, mistakes from happening again. So uh, before start, so like just a little bit of background for myself. I uh, used to work at uh, various machine learning problems at different companies like Google, LinkedIn, Square, Cocademy, and now my own company. So just a little bit of advertisement. So my company helps uh, uh, companies to pre-screen their engineer or uh, machine learning engineer candidates. So we are very proud of our scalability and the accuracy. So if there are hiring managers here, want to look for different ways to automate the hiring, uh, technical screening process, come talk to me. I would love to chat more. Uh, one interview, one interview the I.O. If you got a chance to go look it up sometime. Oh. But even better, so like the website is actually pretty planned. So even better way, we just LinkedIn invited me and I'll, we can chat more. Okay. So uh, just want to preface the talk. So I wanted to share some, in my opinion, what the responsibility of a data scientist should be. Right, first of all, I think the, it's, to be a good data scientist, you have to understand the, uh, the business objective, right? Of course. So and uh, try to align that with the, uh, the loss function. I actually have seen a lot of times that this is not true. So uh, this, even though as simple as it sounds, uh, this is actually very interesting to see. Uh, in reality, not that many people actually realize that. And uh, second, like, of course, you have to understand your data. Uh, each data set is very unique, and you want to find the best modeling algorithm whose assumption fit the best with your data, right? And the third, you have to understand the weakness of your data and the, your particular the features you are using and the, the, uh, your modeling algorithm. Then you can iterate and try to address those weaknesses, and hopefully through fast and frequent experiments. So now let's talk about the problems. Today, I want to, uh, the, the mistakes. So I will share like seven common mistakes. So the first one is, uh, again, take default loss function for granted. This is directly connected to the first point I just mentioned, align the business objective to your uh, loss function. And maybe just sharing one example, right? Say, uh, for instance, let's say we are building a, a fraud detection system for, uh, let's say, for Amazon. So there are so many transactions. And then like say, uh, let's say uh, I'm the uh, monitor trying to solve that problem. And I pick a classifier, right? So I, whatever, like say decision tree. So then like the first question is what loss function do I use, right? So do I use the accuracy? Maybe initially that sounds intuitive, but then, like quickly you realize if you use accuracy, if you classify all the transaction to be good transaction, you probably get about like 98% accurate, right? So then you probably think about, okay, so maybe like precision recall trade-off, maybe, so it sounds reasonable. But like if you really look at the problem, right, your business objective, it's not those counts. It's more the fraud loss. It's the dollar amount, right? So then like your actual loss function should be more like the expected loss of the, or act, the, the, uh, yeah, the expected loss for each fraudulent transaction, right? So, be careful with this, because this is actually a very, very often overlooked detail, right? So then uh, many times, loss function are not that easily customizable. Some model uh, algorithm allow you to customize loss function, but some don't. You can do like over simply, down simply, whatever. But also like, uh, if you cannot do that, at least try to simulate your model before you deploy it, okay? Or if you still cannot do that for some reason, so at least find some other correlated indicator correlated to your label. Okay, so uh, that would be my first suggestion. And also, like, feel free to ask questions anytime. Love the, the chat to be interactive. Okay. So the second common mistake is use a planned linear model for nonlinear interactions. So, uh, I don't want to share which company, but I actually seen uh, uh, a fraud detection model was built uh, with uh, logistic regression, right? So there's nothing like, okay. 
it's not ridiculous wrong, but in a way that would you really believe uh, your fraud probably is like a linear combination through a sigmoid transformation. Uh, it's a linear combination of your features, even though through another sigmoid trans uh, transformation, right? So do you really believe, say, if you have a, a, account, a, a feature called account age, do you really believe, like, say, uh, one unit of change, like, say, between 500 days account age to 501 is equivalent to zero day to one day? Right, so be aware if you use linear model and you, you have high, uh, like highly complex uh, uh, problem, you have to do a lot of feature engineer. If not, then maybe depends on your, your, your data size. Consider some high variance model, right? So, but sometimes it's necessary, right? So if you don't have, uh, if you have limited computation power and you have, you are dealing with like large design metrics like say text, whatever, right? So sometimes you, you are forced to use very simple model, right? And uh, sometimes, like say, you just have uh, and way le less than p. So number of features, number of samples, way less than number of features, right? So now, of course, uh, you should consider if not that those are not the case. Consider use uh, models with higher variance. And one simple test is one simple trick. I think uh, pretty uh, useful is think about like say you have this much data, you build this linear model, right? Try to use smaller amount of data. Right, to see if that affects the performance. Right? If that doesn't affect the performance, that likely uh, imply that you can use less data. So you are not, your model is actually making use of all the data you have. So then you can probably reasonably assume using a higher variance model to really make use of all the data you have would be a reasonable choice. Okay? So the third common problem I've seen is uh, forgot about li outliers, right? So this is actually very, very important. So uh, it is really important to determine what caused the outliers, right? Give me, uh, let's give some example. So one would be like say, uh, I, have a, I have temperature data, right? I have some like outrageous uh, uh, temperature number uh, in my data set. Right? It could be from like say, uh, my thermostat was broken, right? You definitely want to do something with those data, right? Otherwise, you don't want your you just don't want your model to generalize upon those broken data, right? So, second of all, let's say another kind of scenario. Let's say I'm again like looking at the fraud detection problem. Let's say all of a sudden I see a, a fraudulent transaction with transaction amount like say one million dollar. So, the first thing I would do is, what the hell is going on? So I want to go deep and like I want to make sure. I will catch that transaction if that happens again. So outliers sometimes can indicate very, very interesting user behavior or pattern that can give you a lot of insight. Right? So depending on what caused the outliers, <coughs> then you know like, whether you want your model to be trained upon those data or not. So then you can do the right thing accordingly. Okay? And the, the, the fourth mistake is high variance model when n is way less than p. Again, number of uh, samples way less than number of features. This is actually pretty common in, <coughs> uh, I'll say, uh, Medicare industry. So uh, I've seen some data set uh, with just with uh, like hundreds of patients data, but a lot of the different features, like thousands of features. So, and for those models, I've seen people use like SVN with kernel to uh, like really high variance model. So what do we do with those, right? So first of all, of course, consider a model with less variance, right? That, in that kind of situation, probably like some linear model would work great and just try it. And second, uh, when you have uh, so much fewer samples than features, likely it implies that you cannot rely on your modeling algorithm to do everything for you. It's more so the case when you have less data than when you have a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of data, right? So you really want to look for heuristic, talk to domain experts to look for insights, right? And build those insights into your modeling algorithm. And in this case, particularly through regularization, because you essentially already have a search space much, much larger than your sample can actually uh, represent the online distribution, right? So 
you have to regularize your uh, uh, search space. And there are many clever ways to do regularization, say, but some simple, simple things could be like, hey, I know this feature. So the, the sweet spot is like between five to 10. So like say, anywhere out of five to 10, I give a like high penal, uh, penalty, something like that, whatever. So, and the, the, uh, the fifth mistake would be uh, L1 and L2 regularization without standardization. It's actually very, uh, so I think in the, in about like five years ago, so L1 and L2 logistic regression and linear regression are very, very popular. And I've seen this happen a lot. So uh, why is it important to standardize? And actually, I want to, uh, this is actually very interesting, so I want to mention a, little, uh, a few things more. So first of all, like using any models, it, is, it could be detrimental if you use some modeling algorithm, make some assumption, severely easy, violate your property of the, the property of the data, right? So the same idea apply to the regularization algorithm as well. So you don't want to just randomly regularize things because they all make different uh, assumptions, right? For instance, if you are doing a L2, so it's likely saying, oh, you, Im you impose a, a normal prior over your uh, parameters, right? If you use L1, it's like more like a Laplacian prior over your uh, parameter space. Do, do those assumptions make sense to your data set? So you have to ask yourself that. Just bear in mind, all models, all regularization, they all make different assumptions, right? So, and second of all, like in this case, uh, a very implicit uh, 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 kind of assumption is since if you put an L1 or L2 on your feature, uh, on your parameters, it treats all parameters the same, right? That kind of implies all your features has to be on the, put on the equal foot, right? So one simple way to do that is to standardize them. So if you don't do that, imagine, like say, again, I'm gonna use fraud detection as another example, right? Say you have a feature called transaction amount in dollars, right? So the, let's say you build a logistic regression model, whatever, so the coefficient right now is like five. One day, you're like, okay, so I want to change that feature to be in cents, right? So the, the feature raw value grows a hundredfold, right? The coefficient, of course, uh, reduced to one over a hundred, right? So all of a sudden, it penalizes it penal, the, it penalize, the regularization penalize the uh, coefficient differently. So that just means without giving the model any more information, just rescale your data and you have a different model. So is that something reasonable? Most likely not, right? So this is a very simple test. So think about like rescaling and to see if that might affect your data because a lot of times, uh, yeah, it's just not the desirable effect. And another thing is, if you put, if you standardize your feature, then what does that mean? So you actually are assuming those features are more or less normally distributed, right? You put them on zero mean and the one variance, right? What if your feature is exponentially distributed? So then what happens when you standardize it, right? Do you need to take a log before you standardize it? or do you need to do other things, right? What if uh, it's a count? So <clears throat> what is monomial, what is categorical, what do you do, right? So think about those things before you apply any like say fancy uh, algorithm. This is not even fancy, so any algorithm, right? So yes. All right, the sixth mistake, use a linear model without considering uh, multi-collinear predictors. So uh, this is actually very, very, very common and a lot of people, have, yeah, this is actually even an uh, interview question right now because it's just so commonly seen. So regardless, uh, what, what would happen if you have, uh, but, oh, by the way, so multi-collinear means uh, one feature is a linear combination of other features. All right, so what would happen when you use a linear model? And by linear model, I mean like say, through whatever transformation, but underlying it is your feature and uh, the, is your feature times the, uh, sorry, dot product, the, 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 your coefficient, okay? So in that case, if you one feature is a linear combination of some other features, so your weight can actually flow, uh, 
very uh, smoothly to from one uh, predictor to other predictors. Because at the end of the day, they, their linear combination will still be the same. Right? So that makes your model training higher variance. It's not necessarily a, 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 a deal breaker per se, but it just makes the, the problem very ill uh, conditioned and less desirable. And because one day you can have this data set and train, and you're like, okay, so uh, this feature is very important based on the coefficient. Uh, and, but actually, I will say another thing about like interpreting uh, uh, importance uh, th through coefficient. But anyways, so uh, but very next day you might find uh, your coefficient shift a lot. So but without affecting the, the model performance much. So it's just make things more opaque and just less understandable. So what do you do? At least you check feature correlation, right? So and the second thing you want to do feature selection and either manually or in a more automated way, right? So, but there are more to that. Some models are more uh, reliable or resilient to correlated features, particularly like those uh, tree-based model. Once you use a, a, your branch use some feature and the, the other correlated feature will become like say, re uh, much less relevant, okay? And other things like uh, L2 regularization help you to help the modeling algorithm to uh, prefer evenly distributed uh, uh, parameter coefficient. So that helps, because uh, uh, I, I suppose, uh, yeah, does that make sense? Or do I lose people? Okay, cool. So yeah, when people don't ask questions, I feel nervous. It's kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the seventh and the, the last uh, common mistake I've seen is uh, interpreting the <laughs> absolute value of coefficient from a linear or logistic regression as feature importance. This, uh, I would say, for most of the problem and for the audience here, like we are dealing with, we probably should just don't do it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, the problem is, uh, the, the, there are two major problems. I'm pretty sure there are more, but like, to me, there are two major ones. So the first one is, again, if you scale the, the feature, so uh, you actually scale the coefficient accordingly, right? So then, like, if you assume, like, say, the absolute value of the coefficient is, could be the feature importance. Again, so all of a sudden, when you change the transaction uh, dollar amount to, like, in cent, then all of a sudden, your feature becomes, like, 100 times less important. So does that really make sense? No, right. And the, the second thing is a uh, collinear feature also allow coefficient to shift, right? So we just uh, covered that, right? So the fundamental assumption of interpreting the feature importance as the absolute value of coefficient is like if you can say fix all the other features, and you just change one feature value, move up one unit, move down one unit. So how does that affect the label? Right, that's what they are trying to do. But this usually doesn't apply to the problems that we are trying to solve because usually we have many, many features. So very likely you have uh, one feature to be linear combination of others. Right? And not say even when you don't have that many features, you also need to be careful. Right? So what if you have one feature called humidity and the other feature called temperature? So do you really think you can fix the humidity and just shift the, the uh, temperature just up and down. And also, do you think, like say you are building the uh, real estate model, so you have number of bathrooms and number of bathrooms. So those features are highly correlated. You cannot just change one. Assume you can change one and fix others, right? So for most of the data set we are dealing with, I just suggest don't interpret the, uh, the, the absolute value of the coefficient. So essentially, I think that's it. So if you are interested in those topic, please uh, follow me at Twitter. And uh, this is my blog and one interview website. So any question? Do I lose everyone? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Yeah, feel free to come ask me a question if you have uh,